Feel like you're being pulled in a thousand directions? Let's fix that. Download your free rebalancing toolkit and learn how to design an optimized week that lets you feel like you have it all. Get the goods at brilliantbalance.net slash have it all. I'm Sherilyn Skolnicki, and this is Brilliant Balance, the show for working women who are ready to shine. Each week, I bring you ideas, inspiration, and insight on balance, business, and getting it all done gracefully. You ready? Let's be brilliant. Hello and welcome. This is episode 15 of Brilliant Balance. And if you're new to the show, I am so glad you're here. You're choosing a great episode to begin your Brilliant Balance journey because today we're going to talk about a feeling that a lot of us have suffered through. Um, I know I have, and virtually every woman that I have coached has at some point uncovered an experience, either current or in her past, where she has experienced this sense of being a fraud, which sounds so crazy the first time you hear it, right? Because we don't walk around thinking we're a fraud. We don't think we're doing anything dishonest. But the experience of having the external perception of what we're doing or who we are not match the internal feelings that we're having about it has been classified under this term, the imposter syndrome. And that's what we're going to dig into today. It's that nagging sentiment that while things may look really good on the outside, if anyone knew how you felt on the inside, they would either lose faith in you or they would say that you didn't really deserve it or they would say, you know, I can't believe that she's somebody who accomplished this. And this syndrome shows up in lots of different areas of life, right? Not just business, although that is a very typical place for it to rear its head. It also shows up in the arenas of like, you know, motherhood and um, marriage. It certainly shows up in business, but also in um, the way we show up in our communities. So there are these narratives for women that say, you know, what it looks like to be a good mom or a good wife or um, a thriving entrepreneur or a top executive, right? Or any of the other things that you're pursuing. And the imposter syndrome is when someone else may assign that title to you, but you don't really feel like it's appropriate. So what I want to do in today's episode is we're going to sort of dig through a few separate underpinnings of this syndrome, right? Reasons that it might show up, corollaries to the story that might be running through your head. And there are four of them that I'm going to talk about today so that you can maybe get underneath why you might be feeling the way you are. Because the bottom line is, it's not a helpful feeling, right? Feeling like you're an imposter, feeling like you're posing as someone who you're not is really a recipe for disaster, right? There's so much inauthenticity inherent in that feeling that we have to get to the bottom of it so that we can get rid of it. Because when we feel like we're truly embodying the presence that we're projecting to the outside world, when we feel like there is alignment between how other people see us and how we see ourselves, then we really are in that position to step fully into our potential, to bring you know our highest energy into our day-to-day life. So We're going to pick through these four and see if there's any clues here about why you might be experiencing these feelings and then what you can do about them. So first one, the first one is when how it looks is different than how it feels. All right, so let's talk about this. Anything that we have ever aspired to, we sort of see it from the outside first, right? We see someone else do it. And we imagine how it must feel. So maybe it's the VP in the corner office in your company. 
And you see her come into work every day, and you see the car she's driving and the clothes she's wearing, maybe the bag she's carrying, maybe the way she commands control of a room during a meeting, maybe the way other people look at her with respect. You know, maybe it's the picture of her family that's on her desk, but you take all of this in. And you project, essentially. You imagine what it must feel like to be the person with that role, how confident you know she must be, and how clear about her objectives, and, and how clear about the direction that she wants to set, and how organized everything must be at home, and the kind of help she must have. And you create this whole story about what it must feel like to be her. And you could do the same thing with anybody where you sort of aspire to their situation. I remember one time going to a wedding when I was newly married, um, didn't have any children, went to a wedding, and there was this mom on the dance floor with these three adorable young children, you know, maybe a baby, a preschool-age child, and then maybe a, you know early school-age child. And she was out there in a cute dress and, and just dancing with these three kids, looking like she was having a ball. And I remember thinking – how awesome it would be to be her, you know, that what that must feel like to have built your family and then still be able to come out and have this great night celebrating. You know, and of course, many years later, when I was that mom at the wedding with my three young children, someone may have looked at me and thought the same thing. But now I knew the backstory. Now I knew what it felt like on the inside of that experience, what it took to get there. You know, the one who threw the tantrum in the bathtub that didn't want to put the suit on to come to the wedding, the, you know, the one who didn't want to walk down the aisle, like all of those pieces of the story were part of the experience, but someone looking at it from the outside only sees, you know, what's observable to the outside eye. So that's really what happens, right, is we get to the experience. It's finally ours to embody, and it doesn't feel the way we imagined. So maybe you become that VP with the corner office, but you're still not feeling very confident when you walk into the boardroom. Or you still are not feeling like you have complete command of your organization. Or it's a struggle to get out the door every morning and get the kids to school and get yourself dressed in that outfit that everyone was admiring from the outside and carry that bag that everyone thinks is amazing and walk into that office. But there's all this chaos happening, you know, in your mind as you're there. So so what that does is it creates dissonance between how we imagined it would be and what it actually feels like when we get there. And because of that, we think we must be doing it wrong. And so we can't let anyone know because if they knew, they would think we didn't deserve to be there. And this pattern is really one of the things that is at the heart of the imposter syndrome. It's that we had a vision, we imagined how it would feel to get there, and then we get there and it doesn't feel that way, and so we think we must not be doing this right or we must not be worthy of really being in this position, right? Somehow we ended up here by accident. So... That's a tricky one because you are always going to have an incomplete picture when you're viewing it from the outside. And by definition, when you're experiencing it, you're going to have this complete picture. So softening your definition of how it will feel, really thinking about the complete picture is the only way through this one. It's allowing your true experience, the one you're actually having, to be the definition instead of some imagined experience that you'd projected when you were watching it from the outside. That's the first one, but there's a few other ones, right? So the second one is this belief that if I can do it, it must not be worth very much. So here's the example I'll use. I remember for years looking at the 40 under 40 lists when they came out and thinking, man, those people have made it. You know, look at the accomplishments. Look at the accolades that they're getting for what they've done. I mean, that that really is something to aspire to. When I was in my 20s and in my 30s, I remember reading those lists every year and just thinking, wow, those people, they have it going on. And then I got on the list. 
And what happened was not what you might expect. I didn't feel this overwhelming sense of pride for having gotten on the list. I totally devalued the list because I was on it, right? This sort of goes back to there's this old Yogi Berra quote where he says, I wouldn't be a member of any club that would have me. And it's the same principle. That list was the same list. But once I had been named to it, it didn't seem as prestigious anymore, right? Because I was able to get on it. And I think we've all had this experience where when it's an accomplishment that we haven't attained yet, we assign a whole lot of value to it because it seems hard, right? Maybe it's being a published author. Maybe it's having a blog. Maybe it's starting your own business. Maybe it's attaining that particular title in a company. But then you get there, and because you've done it, it doesn't seem so hard anymore. And so now we devalue the whole accomplishment. And so that's another sort of incarnation of this imposter syndrome is if I can do it, then it really isn't worth very much. And you kind of, you'll you'll feel the tendency to want to run around and tell everybody it's not really a big deal. So that's one of the ways that you can diagnose this particular angle on the imposter syndrome. Feel like you're being pulled in a thousand directions? Let's fix that. Download your free rebalancing toolkit and learn how to design an optimized week that lets you feel like you have it all. Get the goods at brilliantbalance.net slash have it all. So the third one, the third manifestation of this is when we diminish the scale of the accomplishment so that it doesn't count. So this is how this shows up. Let's go back to being an author. Let's say you've aspired to be a published author. A lot of entrepreneurs, um, especially, have a desire to be a published author. And what's happened in the world of publishing is self-publishing has become a really big thing. So I've had many conversations with women entrepreneurs who are, in fact, published authors who have self-published, where when you say to them, like, okay, so that's awesome, you've published a book they quickly jump in with, oh, no, but I actually self-published, as though that somehow makes them not a published author, right? Because it wasn't Simon & Schuster or Penguin. They feel like it doesn't count, okay? Another example would be if someone um, has a title that they've always aspired to. Let me just give you a specific example. I spent a lot of my career at a very large multinational company, Okay, so to attain a title like senior vice president or CEO was truly a winnowing down of the masses to the elite few. So a lot of people in that company would aspire to those titles and having assigned like a level of struggle to that journey. They knew just how hard it was going to be to get there, just how elite it would be to achieve the title. And a lot of people, as they rise through the ranks in this company, ultimately leave to go be very senior leaders at other companies. And when they go do that, they often attain you know, several leaps in title. So maybe they leave as a marketing director and they go to the next company as the chief marketing officer or a CEO. So if you cross paths with them and say, wow, you know, congratulations on being the CEO of this company, they're like, oh yeah, but it's only a $5 million company or it's only a $50 million company because the company that we were leaving was billions and billions of dollars in sales. So there's this diminishing of the scale of the accomplishment. Guess what? They are still a CEO carrying the mantle of leadership, making all of the decisions. It's just that the dollars of revenue for the company or the number of employees isn't as big. And yet they feel like, oh, you're giving me credit I don't deserve because I didn't get to be the CEO of the $50 billion company. So this doesn't count. Here's another example. Let's say you're a runner and you train for marathons and 10Ks and and you run, but you typically are kind of middle of the pack. And you go to a 10K and you win your age group. And someone comes over to congratulate you or they're going to give you a medal for winning your age group. But you say, but this was a small race. So it doesn't really count. All of these are examples, and I wanted to pick three really different sort of walks of life where it could show up, where 
you can't accept the compliment or the accolades for what you've done because you didn't do it at a high enough level for you to count it. So you feel like I'm getting credit for being a published author, being the CEO, winning my age group when I didn't really deserve it. That's the sentiment that's that's sitting underneath this imposter syndrome. Um, and again, it's not helpful because what the the frame that would be more helpful is to say, yes, I am. And then if you have aspirations of of using that as a platform to attain that same result at an even higher level, right, a bigger race, a bigger company, a bigger publishing house, by all means, go for it. But every time you diminish it, you actually weaken your chances of being able to rise to the next level. So those are three that we've talked about so far, right? We talked about when it looks different than it feels, right? How it looks on the outside is different than how it feels on the inside. We talked about if I can do it, then it's probably not worth very much. And then we talked about diminishing the scale of the accomplishment to the point where it doesn't count. And here's the fourth one that I want to dig into today. This is the notion that you didn't earn it, that it somehow came too easily. And so you don't deserve the credit. This shows up in a lot of interesting places where people feel like uh, maybe they had a connection that helped them get into a particular role or circumstance or company, or maybe um, they were able to acquire something at less than the full market value, right? Like they got a great deal on it. And so people see them with that possession, but they don't really feel like They don't want people to assume that they've paid a certain amount for it or that they have taken the traditional path to achieving whatever that thing is. So I have another personal example here that may sound silly, but um, it's one of the first times I really remember feeling this way. And it was the year after we got married. My husband and I went to Paris, and it was the first time either one of us had ever been to Europe, much less to Paris. And we had this incredible, just extraordinary opportunity to stay at the Ritz Hotel, which, um, if you know anything about Paris, is probably the most famous hotel property in the city. And when I was an undergrad, I studied hotel administration at Cornell. So it was just a dream to be able to go and have this iconic hotel experience in this iconic city. Um, And it was a gift. My best friend had gifted a couple of nights at this hotel to us as a wedding gift. And um, we were excited to get to go. So we went and we had this you know, vacation in France and we're going to end with these couple of nights at the Ritz in Paris. And we checked into the hotel and what I remember feeling was I was mortified, which is not, by the way, how I expected to feel. <laughs> I expected to feel delighted to be there, um, indulged, taken care of, but I didn't. I felt like I didn't belong. Even though I was the one with the reservation, I was standing there having the experience, checking in, opening the door to the room, right? Having that signature cocktail mixed at Bar Hemingway. Like the whole experience was in fact unfolding. But my husband and I have talked about this many times over the years. I spent a lot of those few days feeling like we don't belong here. I think it was because it had been gifted to us. So I didn't feel maybe like I'd earned it. The circumstances of how I got there didn't match up with the way I had always assumed I would get there. And so it just didn't feel right. Um, And I thought people are going to look at us and think, here are these you know, 25, 26-year-old kids, quote unquote, what right do they have to be staying at this hotel? That was the tape that was running through my head, which really tampered the full enjoyment of that experience, right, in retrospect. Let me give you another example. Maybe you buy a car that you've always dreamed of. Like maybe you've always dreamed of driving a BMW and you finally buy this BMW. And what you know is that you spent a lot of time researching great used vehicles and you ran the whole matrix to calculate the very best value you possibly could get for this car. And you actually bought this BMW for less than you could have bought like a Toyota for. But then you have to drive the car and park the car and be seen in the car. And when you do, everyone starts saying, wow, what a great car. Like they think it's new. They think it's beautiful. They're complimenting you for it. 
And what do you do? You immediately want to tell them about how you got this fabulous deal on the car and you actually paid less for it than you would pay for a Toyota. Why do we do that? We do that because we don't want to be mistaken for someone who either would or could pay full price for that vehicle. Now, not everybody struggles with this. Some people are more than happy to tell you that they paid full price for the vehicle and they're proud of the accomplishment. That person is not suffering from the imposter syndrome, okay? The imposter syndrome symptom is when you are concerned that someone is going to think that you are trying to be someone you are not and you are very quick to correct them, right? To bring that back into alignment with how you actually see yourself, The key to this one is to be able to have the experiences that you're blessed with, to have the the possessions or acquisitions that you would be blessed to have without constantly apologizing for them. Otherwise, don't have the experience. You have to be able to settle into it saying, it doesn't matter if it was gifted to you or if you got a great deal on it. It doesn't matter if you had the hardest possible path to having that experience. What matters is that you're having it and to be able to truly settle in and enjoy it. So those are the four things. When when I listen to women talk about the imposter syndrome in all of its various forms, those are the four most common sort of patterns underlying why they're experiencing it. It's how it looks is different than how it feels. You know, if you can do it, it must not be worth much. It's discounting the scale of the accomplishment, or it's that sentiment that you didn't earn it. Remember, at the root of all of this is the fear that someone will accuse us of claiming credit that we don't actually deserve, and we just want to beat them to the punch. But if we can really lay that down, then we get to claim the results and the experiences as our reality. It's only then that we're going to be able to step into our true potential. Like Without sidestepping this imposter syndrome, there will be no fulfillment of our potential because we'll keep diminishing ourselves in an effort not to have the perception of what we're doing get ahead of us. So I hope that gives you some good things to think about. It's really important that you get to the bottom of this feeling if it's something that's holding you back. This is kind of heavy, right? So next week, we're going to switch gears a bit. Next week, we are heading into Valentine's Day. And I thought it might be a good time to talk about where your spouse or your partner falls on your priority list. Because for so many women, you know, your spouse or your partner falls at the bottom of the list. And while you may not necessarily be proud of that, changing it can really sometimes seem like an uphill battle. So that's what we're going to dig into next week is what do you do when you realize that, oh my goodness, my spouse or my partner has somehow ended up at the bottom of my priority list. We're going to talk about that next week. So that's all for today. And I want to tell you, if this resonated with you, take a minute, rate the podcast. Um, I'd love to hear what you think, or send it off to somebody else who might enjoy hearing it. And you may also want to join us. Um, We have a brilliant balance group in Facebook. Just go there, search in groups, and uh, request to join, and we'll get you added into the conversation so we can support you as you explore these topics and bring some changes into your own life. That's it for today, my friends. Until next time, go be brilliant. This is the podcastfactory.com.